And so uh, just to kind of wrap up a little bit more following up on the reproducibility. Um, this is a, another case um, that relates to reproducibility. This is very has been very visible in the last year or a little bit more. Uh, so a fellow at uh, Imperial College in the UK did, does uh, epidemiological modeling. And at the very beginning of the COVID-19 situation, he did some models for that and he briefed parliament based on those modeling studies and uh, they acted based on those studies. So, so that was the initial response. It was very influential. And um, the code that he used was out there, it had been out there for a while actually. Um, and on April 1st, uh, a fellow named Nicholas Lewis uh, had looked at that code and said, you know, he wasn't really happy with it. He said he couldn't easily see where some of the assumptions come from and he published a blog article. And among the things he said was, moreover, the computer code is old, unverified, and documented inadequately, if at all. Um, and actually, this is something that Neil Ferguson agreed with. Um, uh, and um, so you can, you can understand that um, given the situation, uh, this got into the press pretty quickly. And the, the press reacted pretty strongly. You can see some quotes there. Uh, Imperial College model Britain used to justify the lockdown is a buggy mess, totally unreliable, things like that. These are, you know, this is not the way most of us want to get our um, codes recognized in, in the press, I think. And um, what you may not have heard about this story, if, if you heard about the first bit, uh, is a little bit later in April, uh, the folks at Imperial collaborated with Microsoft to refactor and clean up the code. It's out there on GitHub in a much prettier form. Um, another um, sort of um, person out in the community, Phil Bull, um, rebutted a lot of the criticisms of Imperial's code, um, but uh, he said some things which um, I think in, uh, are worth more consideration, and that's up on the top right. Many scientists write code that's crappy stylistically, but is nevertheless scientifically correct. Uh, commercial software developers are well qualified to review code style, but must don't have a clue about checking scientific validity or what counts as good scientific practice. So one thing you might want to think about is uh, what do you think uh, about this quote? And I'll have a comment of our um, the assessment that we came to in some discussions in our project in a minute. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is there's an organization in the UK called CodeCheck, which is out there, their purpose is to independently reproduce uh, numerical simulations. And so they took on Ferguson's original um, code and his report and uh, that, you know, from the, from the briefing to parliament, and they were actually able to reproduce that work. And, and that report is out there as well. So, you know, this is another example of um, maybe an unexpected use or examination of people's code. We put a lot of code out there in public and it may be used in ways that you don't expect by people you don't know or seen by people uh, you don't know. So you might wanna think about this. Uh, and that's not to say you shouldn't put your code out there. You should just try to make it better. Um, increasingly consequential decisions are made based on computational results. And it's really completely justified in my opinion that the codes that produce those results should be subject to greater scrutiny. The scientific credibility of this software is strongly connected to good software engineering practices. We heard in just this example about concerns about documentation, about testing and verification and validation where that's possible. Um, code readability and quality metrics are important as well. Um, and then we got into this discussion of should we excuse uh, scientific software for being crappy stylistically. And our uh, conclusion about that within our ideas project was that crappy code can hide bugs. So yeah, it may be uh, a bit of an excuse, but um, it's not really a good excuse. It's uh, a easy place for bugs to get introduced and makes them harder to find. So try to do a better job is basically our conclusion. So once again, to hit this point, science through computing is at best as credible as the software that produces it. We've covered a bunch of topics in this tutorial. Um, we didn't have time because of the short 
period for this to do the continuous integration testing, but we had noticed that there were several other talks about CI practices in the um, in the rest of the conference. So I think you probably heard about that as well. There's a lot of things that we didn't have time to talk about, and these are all important topics. There is no doubt about that. Um, and some of these people find more challenging than some of the things that we did talk about today, probably. The distinction that we're making by not including these things is really that there are um, a lot of, uh, these are sort of more common, they're not so particular to scientific software. And so there's a lot of other resources that are available out there. And so uh, we encourage you if uh, these are some of your uh, concerns to, to go out and look for other resources. And one place to help uh, do that, which I'll talk about in a second, is the Better Scientific Software website. Um, but your reaction here might be, um, you're a researcher and you can't afford to spend all of your time on software engineering. You've got to do some science, right? And so I'll go back to the suggestion that we had at the beginning of incremental software improvement processes. You don't have to do everything at once. You need enough software engineering so that you can be effective in your scientific work, both in the short term and in the long term. And so there's this piece of process that we've developed, um, uh, basically identifying pain points and then working, you know, just pick one, work to uh, improve it, and then work on the next one. And um, the bssw.io site that I've mentioned um, is a collection of resources that might help you in that. And if you're not finding things that um, you need, or if you find resources that we don't have in BSSW, please consider contributing them. It's uh, quick and easy. And actually next Wednesday under the ECP, we have a, um, a BOF for how to contribute to BSSW.io and how to use BSSW.io. You can ask us about that in the chat and I can provide more info. So with that, we're at an end. I want to thank you all very much for your um, spending your time with us. We're happy to continue this conversation in email or after the um, session if, if you want to join us in person. If you submit pull requests to the um, hands-on activities, we'll comment on those. Uh, and we have this website where we have the, uh, the hands-on activities, the presentation slides, and things like that. If you want to follow our project activities, there's a, a mailing list you can join, and the Better Scientific Software site also has a monthly digest or an RSS feed, if you prefer that. And with that, we thank you very much.